Professor Manfred Reichert. He will uh, tell you about his experiences um, over the past 10 years um, in which he and his group have worked very closely together with uh, Daimler in the uh, automotive domain, which has led to a range of insights, new techniques, uh, new technologies and also a lot of experience on how these technologies and all these techniques how they work out in practice. So uh, without further ado I will give hand over the microphone to Professor Reichert who will tell you more about the automotive domain and BPM. Please. Thanks Hayo for uh, these nice words and also for uh, the, giving me the opportunity to present uh, yeah some of the results uh, we do in collaboration with Daimler and in the context of our Daimler BPM roundtable. At Ulm we collaborate with uh, yeah, different domains, uh, also including healthcare, but I thought it might be a bit uh, more interesting to, to mix a bit and not to continue with healthcare, but now to dig a bit deeper into uh, automotive engineering and you will see that to some degree it's not that uh, different from healthcare. <laughs> so I'm in both domains, so I should uh, know. Um, as I already uh, told Hayo uh, before arriving here, uh, Daimler is close to the end of their accounting year, so they have to close all the projects uh, within this month, so it's very difficult for them uh, to travel. But here you can see some of the guys, and these are only very few ones, uh, particularly those uh, from Daimler with whom I collaborate uh, very closely. This is Joachim Herbst, uh, who also did some work on process mining before leaving for Daimler. And this is uh, Thomas Bauer, uh, with whom I collaborated for more than a decade. And all these guys you are seeing here are uh, PhD students. The five ones in this row already have completed, and these are three PhD students currently uh, working for uh, Daimler in projects with the University of Ulm. We have different uh, models of funding these uh, projects. Sometimes Daimler gives the money to the university. Sometimes um, we supervise external students from Daimler. And uh, to show you that this can be very attractive, so this is uh, Bela, my first Daimler student. Uh, he graduated or did his, finished his PhD when I still was in Twente, so I have been working for three years in the Netherlands. So um, for him, of course, the university did get the premiers. I already was in Ulm, so I did not get much. But then things got better, that's Ralf. He worked on process visualization. And when we finished his project, I got this uh, present from Daimler, showing you uh, that it can be really attractive to work in this field. <laughs> but uh, uh, the next one who completed was, was uh, Dominic. He worked on the field of large complex uh, process structure in the engineering of electric electronic components in the car. And again, after we successfully finished, <laughs> I got another one. <laughs> and please realize it's still a bit bigger. So expectations were rising. Number of PhD students coming from Daimler were rising. And uh, with Alena, it even become, became better. She worked on process variants. I will show you this work in a few seconds. And now it's really getting, <laughs> getting interesting when seeing all the other students there. I will put this here because when taking the viewpoint of Daimler, I will move to this desk that you are aware of this Daimler, and here, that's me. And now I would have loved to say you, because uh, a few days ago, Stefan uh, completed his thesis, and then I would love to say you, well, let's go outside and look what I got <laughs> for his. But to disappoint you and me, that's what I got. <laughs> Economic crisis is beginning. OK, uh, so let us dig a bit deeper into what we did uh, with these guys. Just to give you an idea where Daimler Research uh, is located, that's in Ulm, a city between Munich and Stuttgart, all Dutch people going for skiing, uh, somehow pass Ulm, and these are very uh, nice buildings uh, there. Uh, I will only discuss three issues here, 
Uh, also, we did many more uh, in collaboration with Daimler. I will first discuss about process <laughs> models, particularly large process models, then about large process model collections, and finally about large process structures, the problems and challenges we tackled in this context and the solutions we provided. That's a rather simple process model from the engineering domain uh, by Daimler. Now I have to switch to this desk. Now I'm this Daimler lady with whom Professor Reichert talked uh, a few years ago, and it was about the complexity of their models. And uh, well, I expected that she will talk to me about correctness of the models, about uh, modularization, abstraction, all the things we know from computer science. But her most severe problem was that she was standing with me, showing me such a model on the, uh, on the wall. It was about five meter uh, broad model, so I really enjoyed it very much. And then she said, you know, Mr. Reichert, my biggest problem is that now we will be forced to introduce the average tool set for modeling. So this model will increase in size by factor two. 10 meters, it will no longer fit into this room. And that was the starting point of some work we did in the context of these uh, large process models. And even when digging into, let's say, parts of the model, still complexity is uh, rather high. So what they asked, uh, what Daimler asked us to do is to provide uh, them with some techniques on how to uh, visualize these models, on how to present them to the user, to the engineers, to the domain experts. And as another problem, uh, we also encountered that not all models were already on the wall, but some of them were still, uh, let's say, in the information systems, so showing some behavior, but no one did know how to deal with it. Uh, others were only more or less uh, locked in uh, execution traces. Um, others were explicitly available, etc. But uh, we did some work, which is not that scientific, but we tried to provide different plugins for integrating process data from different sources bringing it to a kind of um, homogeneous model or harmonized model. And then uh, the idea was to present uh, process models in different forms to the user at different levels of abstraction. And for this, we suggested Daimler to realize a visualization component. And that was, let's say, is the first project I want to shortly discuss about. Um, it's the Proviado project. Uh, Ralph and Thomas were collaborating in this project with me. Uh, more or less, we looked at different dimensions on how to visualize large and complex process models. And one of these dimensions is abstraction. Namely, how to uh, simplify a model by eliminating information or by abstracting information, let's say, to, more, to, to a less detailed uh, model. Uh, so here we have maybe an original model, and we would like to come to a model like this, which contains less uh, elements, less nodes, less edges, uh, and so forth. For this, uh, basically you need two kind of operations. I will not dig too deep into technical details, but just to give you an idea. A very simplified version of a change management process in the automotive domain. Uh, and in some cases, you are only interested in activities uh, a particular role works on, while in other cases, you might be interested in different stages of the process. So here we only consider the orange activities and merge them to a model which has some similarity with the, the original model. Or here we abstract a group of activities at different stages to this rather very abstract process, which is, by, uh, which is more or less also sufficient for, for managers. So uh, in this context, uh, a thesis was done. We developed advanced concepts just to show you that it can be a bit more theoretical. So here we have this reduction. So to eliminate all activities, 
no longer needed and to simplify the graph to some extent, or here we aggregate information uh, such that the model becomes more easier. And in some cases, it's not clear how to do this aggregation or how to do the reduction. So there's some flexibility required depending on the use cases for which you want to use uh, the abstracted uh, models. Just one example, again, we do not need to understand the details. It's one uh, process model, that's the original one, and we only want to see the activities of a particular role. And in this uh, approach we developed, it is a, was a multi-layered approach with different kind of operations. And from this model, at the end, we come to this rather uh, simple model. And this is needed in almost every uh, project in this domain. And it's also needed, of course, in healthcare and in many other uh, domains. So what, what we achieved is a powerful mechanism for creating and visualizing such model abstractions. We also call them process views. We provide a high degree of flexibility because we also developed tools in this context which are used by Daimler. And as I mentioned, in some cases, a loss of information is acceptable, for instance, while in other cases it is not. So we, we come up with a, or came up with a parameterizable approach, uh, allowing for different kinds of view building uh, operations and, and the resulting views. And we did not only consider the behavior of the process, but also data, process attributes, and other information. And, and this is important, you need a well-defined semantics for this, which is of course not interesting for Daimler at first glance, but when you intend to implement these things, then you need to know uh, beforehand how the behavior of the operations will be. The second dimension in this project was about adapting the visual appearance. That's no magic behind, but just to give you an idea. So um, sometimes in, these, in this world, people want to have their own symbols or visualization templates to be used for representing single process steps or data elements or users. And uh, sometimes you even want to use different symbols for activities uh, within the same process model. But of course, this should not lead to another process modeling language. But uh, what we did is simply making the notation, the visual notation, exchangeable and to uh, enable configuration of these uh, things. In some cases, you see uh, users don't want to have big event-driven process change with all these satellite objects around uh, an activity, but they simply prefer a compact representation of the process steps with all the attributes or at least selected attributes within. Yeah, that's exactly one example where you see <laughs> if you have two process steps and in a visualization this might look like this depends on the domain where such approach uh, is used. Um, the approach we developed in the Proviado project takes the logical process model and all the information related to the process model, applies um, some well-defined context rules, which links the model to a concrete uh, visual notation, and this results in a concrete visualization at the end. Yeah? And uh, with that kind of support and combining it with abstraction as shown before, for instance, this model could look like this. And uh, we, we, we really uh, realized a very flexible approach. And also what we observed is that um, Daimler asked us also to provide adaptable or customizable ways of how to present process information. For instance, that's from, I think it was Evobus, so it's uh, more like a, a project chart, but this is the way that uh, some of the engineering processes are represented. And uh, for instance, when clicking on one of these uh, symbols, you might come to the next level of detail, which could be a process diagram, for instance. But what they asked us is to provide different ways of uh, yeah, representing and visualizing process information in a diagram, or with swim lanes, or in a kind of project charts, or a table, etc. And um, 
Again, we, this is orthogonal to what I have introduced before. So overall, what we achieved is a powerful visualization component, which takes a logical uh, model, builds an abstraction on it, assigns uh, graphical symbols, fills these symbols with instance data, for example, um, adjusts the layout, and then visualizes the model in one of these ways. The second uh, issue is about large process model collections. So again, a Daimler. Um, that's what you now can more and more find. Uh, repositories, sometimes these repositories consist of hundreds of Excel sheets. Sometimes they are stored in a tool like ARIS. Sometimes they are distributed over several documents or artifacts. And uh, one of the particular challenge in this context is that you can find many processes or process models which look very similar to each other and which actually represent the same process or type of process, but which uh, also smoothly different, uh, differ in the logic uh, due to some application context specific uh, things or issues. For example, here we have the simple process, very simplified uh, variant uh, of uh, vehicle repair in a garage. And this could be the standard process. Yeah, So you receive the car at the garage, you do some diagnosis and in parallel parallels, uh, you conduct some maintenance activities. Then if required, you do a repair and, and finally you hand over the car back to the customer. And now depending on country specific regulations, garage-specific rules uh, on the brand of a car, etc. You might have different variants implemented for this particular process. So here, as you can see, um, you have uh, an additional uh, step uh, replacing these two steps, or here uh, you do Another final check because it's a safety uh, critical repair and you need another check to ensure that everything is okay or here things are combined. So how was Daimler handling these cases? I'm now in words of the Daimler guy who told me, well, we started modeling these variants with Aris toolset and for each new variant we created a new model. And our estimation was that we will have to model about um, 900 variant models. And they stopped after 60 because uh, budget was, uh, they were running out of budget. Uh, which indicates that you can save money in this uh, domain if you ask BPM guys how you might do it better. And uh, of course, there's a lot of work on process configuration, process uh, variant management. Um, we also digged deeper. So that, that was, yeah, just to, to show you. That's the standard process, and then usually they copy and paste it, and then they adapt it to the specific context, resulting in these models. And more or less, when asking the guys, they said, well, we only have two options. Either model every variant in, in one particular model, or putting er everything into one ARIS model. But then it's difficult to distinguish bet let between, let's say, variant parts and normal alternatives that exist for all the process variants. And uh, what we then did, or what, what is clear, the concrete variant always depends on a context. For instance, context dimensions could be the business area, the brand, the vehicle type. And um, it's also clear that not all combinations of these context elements make sense. So usually you only have a small subset of combinations for which particular variants need to be defined. And then for each of these um, yeah, uh, combinations, you have exactly one variant which is then in use. So, and we developed a solution for this in the ProBob uh, project, the two Daimler guys and me. And uh, so what we did was actually we allowed them defining a kind of base process, or <coughs> you may also call it reference process model, 
But as opposed to existing approaches, it, it does not necessarily have to cover all possible behavior, but could be any model. And then we allow for variant specific uh, adjustments of the models, like if country is Italy, we need to insert two steps, or if the brand is smart, we need to delete a certain process uh, fragment. And when applying such variant specific uh, adjustment, of course here they are applied in combination with each other, we obtain a variant specific process model. And um, com coming back to our example, you can see here a kind of base process. You can hear some special markers, which uh, are called adjustment points. And then more or less all possible adaptations are captured in so-called change transactions or options. Here, for instance, uh, we suggest deleting uh, the fragment between this point and that point. So this is this part that then will be deleted. Or here we suggest uh, adding a process fragment consisting of one step between these two adjustment points. And depending on the context, these options need to be applied or not. So we also allow for uh, assigning context rules to these uh, change options. And uh, when evaluating the context, we decide which of the options to apply in which order uh, etc. And this results in a family of process models that you might uh, configure or may configure out of this base process. There are a lot of issues to be considered in this context, uh, namely correctness of the models, um, syntactical, semantical, uh, correct behavior, etc. And we have also looked uh, somewhat into these issues. And as always, uh, when doing such projects, we always build uh, demonstrators or prototypes because usually this then goes into production and is integrated by uh, Daimler into their concrete uh, tool environments. So the achievement was we have a kind of base process and we define the change options. Based on this, uh, we can configure uh, consi uh, by, by taking the context into account variant specific models. And in addition, of course, uh, this has to be mapped to workflow models, which are then actually uh, executed in a workflow engine. So this is another step, which is more a doing step. OK, so these are the first two uh, projects. Uh, and the last uh, but very interesting domain is on large process structures in the development or engineering of electric, electronic components in the car. So what is the challenge? When looking at a modern car, you can see that uh, such a car has many electronic control units. There are about 70 to 90 of these units uh, in the car. And the development and engineering of these units is a very, very complex task. And any delay in this development or any error can become very, very costly. Think of calling cars back which are already sold to the customer. And if you need to do this for, let's say, 100,000 cars, this could be already uh, in yeah, a loss of millions or even more. So we have these electronic control units because they provide a lot of safety critical functions in the car. They also allow for fast implementation of changes because we do not need to change the mechanics of the car, but only the software and then we need to flash it uh, on the electronic uh, control unit. Um, in your modern Daimler car, you have about 10 million lines of code. And I also did uh, hear presentations by other speakers saying, well, that in a few years we have to throw away the cars, not because the mechanics is bad, but the software is too old. And software aging is certainly a problem in this uh, area. Uh, and what is also uh, necessary to understand, that these ACUs are not independent from each other. But there are a lot of dependencies, and these dependencies, of course, also have to be reflected when developing and engineering these components. And um, still, you can see this number 
And that means that innovation in the automotive industry nowadays uh, is very much driven by electric, electronic uh, components. Yeah? Okay, and you know them all, of course. So, uh, just to give you an idea, that's the side door. And some of the electronics in the side door, and you can already see, uh, it's maybe more than one would expect. And uh, as mentioned, we have about 70 to 90. And already these components, they, they, they need to be uh, considered in interplay with each other. So for instance, also when changing the design of the car, you need to contact all the partners developing the different uh, electric electronic components for the side door, for example. Um, what also needs to be considered that many of the breakdowns of car are because of software errors. So there's a lot of uh, work in this domain and we are not interested in, in our, my, my research group in now how to, yeah, how to make the software correct or how to do the testing of the software. We are more interested in how to support the overall process of engineering electric electronic uh, components. And uh, this is a very challenging task because here also we need to deal with variants. Yeah, every car is almost uh, an individual. We need to deal with versions. And uh, what we looked at was the systematic verification and release management. So how does it work uh, nowadays at Daimler? Uh, you have these electric electronic components and then you have these guru, this engineer, knowing all these dependencies uh, com communicating with all the engineers and it's really like this and sometimes it's fascinating to see why these cars are, are running because when you see how what troubles they have what what is forgotten it's it's the error rates let's say are very close to the ones that we did see before for the medical domain so the idea is you have these process or we call them also object life cycles for each of these components and you have all these interdependencies. And the challenge is to support not only the single processes for a particular component, but also the whole process structure. And this requires a support for modeling, execution, maybe also dynamic adaptation, considering the fact that the design of a car might be changed, and also some kind of exception handling. What happens if someone changes a particular part of the car uh, and we already have released um, other components that depend on that particular car? What, what, to whom, whom do we have to contact? What do we have to repeat? Which tests need to be repeated, etc. Very complex. And here we did work in the Corepro project, Dominic, uh, Joachim Herbst and me. And uh, so, well, just to give you a, a, an idea, so I do not want to, again, dig deep into technical details. But here you see a very simplified data model. Usually these data models uh, for a particular uh, electric electronic scenario comprise maybe about eight, nine hundred components. Here we only see four. And here we see, let's say, that the, the type model. This is an instance of this model. We do not need to understand now all the details. And for this type model, which comprises by far fewer uh, entity types than in the instance model, we define so-called object life cycles. These are more or less processes defining the behavior um, of each of these objects during its uh, development. Yeah? So we assigned to each of these object types, these life cycles. So these are state automaton. That means you have a state, you, you, you carry out a process, you come to the next state, you carry out the next process, etc. Must be not always linear. Could be also, let's say, that in a certain, um, when, when carrying out a certain process, you might go back to a previous state and so forth. We also consider these semantic data relations in this context and map them to coordination relations between these object life cycles, like has system corresponds to these two dependencies, which means um, this state may be only reached if this process is completed, and in this other object life cycle, 
this state is reached. Yeah? And the funny thing is now that usually here, remember that I said you have maybe eight, nine hundred components, that out of this information, and knowing that this is an instance of that model, you can also create the process structure instance. So for a concrete engineering project of a particular car or product, the object life cycles, and you can also derive their interdependencies. Sorry. And uh, you can prove now at the type level that uh, this structure is sound, that it will always terminate, um, that uh, data is exchanged the right way, uh, and so forth. And then you create a correctly executable structure. And remember that it's, of course, a more complex structure. This is still a very simplified one. Uh, as mentioned, usually you might have to synchronize up to 900,000 object life cycles. And uh, what we did, we developed an approach for this. And uh, we did some case studies for some particular areas of Daimler, which went very well. And we also did show that based on this kind of model driven approach, you can also easily change a process structure based on mainly changes of the data structure. You change the design of your car, and then you can immediately see how to adapt the process structure. And that, that, that did lead to a significant reduction of uh, modeling and change efforts. And again, we provide prototypes. This is what we can do in a PhD thesis. We cannot develop a, let's say, operational system, but we can show that it works, that the algorithms are correct, and that really there are benefits. And uh, in this particular case, also Daimler mapped this to their existing IT infrastructure and we found a solution on how to map this approach to the IBM process server tool, which was a bit challenging, but at the end uh, it worked. Oops, the book is appearing too quickly. <laughs> so let me uh, allow some uh, concluding remarks. And uh, so I only did give you insights into three different areas we looked at together with Daimler. We also discuss at these round tables uh, all the other problems they have. Drinking uh, very often liters of beer, because sometimes we do this in the evening, offline. And um, it's, it's not always as easy as it looks like here, yeah? because Daimler is a company that needs to earn money. When doing a PhD project with them, it is always decided on a year-to-year -year basis to, to extend the grants, etc. And we also did see a lot of projects that did not run well, because we were not involved. <laughs> no, once they asked me, <laughs> no, once, once they asked me for, um, for an expertise, for a referee report in the area of uh, change management, and um, because the, the boss of Daimler IT was uh, a bit uh, yeah, in favor of an approach uh, implementing change management processes with an agent-based technology. And it took me about one hour to, to write down a few notes like, I cannot see how this approach will scale up. I cannot see how this approach will be maintainable. I cannot see how with this approach you might integrate um, legacy systems. And, uh, but the decision was already made by top managers, so it was not changed again. But I can tell you it was very, very extremely costly uh, for Daimler. <laughs> I will not tell, talk about numbers. Um, also, the, the, the experiences we gathered in these uh, projects, but also projects in the healthcare domain, are also somehow reflected in a book I published with a colleague from uh, University of Innsbruck, Barbara Weber, um, a couple of months ago. This is mainly what I wanted to tell you, and maybe finally uh, two, two sentences to my friend Hayo, uh, who was something saying at the beginning of the day that we always forget about the second. I can tell you we don't forget about the second, and um, particularly not about the World Cup 1974, 
with all these lovely Dutch players, uh, Ari Hahn, Johan Cruyff, uh, Rob Rensenbrink, even this Neskin guy who did score for the Netherlands. So we will never forget the second, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Manfred. We go to the, um, the next part. So we heard a lot about uh, German design, but not only Germany is famous for its design, uh, just as important, perhaps more important for the world is Italian design. Um, are you looking for the connector? Yeah. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the next uh, speakers. Uh, it's a duo, uh, consists of uh, Marco Aymar of the Opera 21 uh, group and uh, Florian Daniel of the University of uh, Trento. Um, they will give you some insights about a very interesting technique, which is uh, the past, in the past period, the past months, the past years uh, already, is gaining a lot of attention, not only in the research uh, domain, but also in the practical application fields. And then I'm talking about mining, process mining, to use these techniques to develop deep insights in how processes in reality, how they operate. And what you will hear about is, um, is another step to making all these kinds of uh, techniques and technologies even more applicable to um, uh, address real life uh, issues. With having said that, I'll hand over the microphone. Uh, my name is Marco Aymar from Opera 21. I will give you a brief introduction to Opera 21 that is probably not uh, well known uh, uh, outside of Italy. And uh, the, um, the steps that we are following in our uh, pro process initiatives uh, and uh, how we are carrying it on uh, the experience we had. Okay, just uh, uh, a few remarks on Opera 21. Opera 21 started in 2004 and is grown uh, very fast to 700 people, more or less. And um, the growth is also due to the fact that uh, Opera 21 uh, acquired a smaller company with a specific uh, skills. It, was, it is not a growth that is uh, linear, but is uh, very, very steep. Our customers are mainly large customers like uh, the Italian Petroleum Company or uh, the Energy Italian Company and this Vodafone on uh, H3G. And uh, we have also a smaller company, co smaller customers for uh, specific domains, like we have a tourist uh, uh, tourism uh, solution, we have warehouse uh, management solutions. And this is where we are located. We are mainly located in Italy, and we have a small uh, commercial offices uh, uh, abroad. OK. Um, I'm managing the research unit on the process initiatives that is concentrated in uh, Milan and in, um, in Rovereto, that is a town very close to Trento. And uh, we have a second research unit uh, in Naples that is uh, uh, mainly concentrated on mobility issues. So I will speak mainly on the first uh, uh, research units. Uh, as a strategy uh, on the research unit, uh, we decided we only use open source. This is also to acquire knowledge uh, internal to the company. So we try to avoid as much as possible to use a commercial uh, solution that would be, uh, if you want, something that could be um, difficult then to propose the solution to our customers. So we prefer to stay on open source solutions. This is the university we collaborate with, that is uh, Professor Casati and uh, Florian Daniel from University of Trento. Milan with Professor Damiani and Naples with Professor Maresca. Okay, here um, an idea of the market, uh, I will not go through it all, but essentially what customers ask us in the last uh, few years is cost optimization. I think in this slide, really the, the critical part is uh, cost optimization. And very often, when we go to the customer, we find out that the, the solution very often are very easy. Uh, we start, especially in the public administration, to work on document management, on uh, uh, dematerialization, on uh, um, record management. What happens in many offices in Italy is that when they receive what we call a certified email, they print it, then tag it, then scan it, and then they send it to the right office. So, there, the solution for technically is quite simple. Just 
have something that uh, gets the email, uh, applies OCR, and depending on simple rules, can forward it to the right office. So cost optimization in a certain situation is, uh, is quite easy, at least at the beginning. And this is maybe not too cool as, a, as an activity, but then it gives you the possibility to propose, uh, okay, why don't we add a simple approval process on the documentation system? Why don't we start uh, uh, manage a group of people with, uh, with roles, etc. So this is, even if it's very simple, it's a, it's a good opportunity for, uh, for our company. Okay, Opera 21 is a, is a system integrator, so we have a very diversified customers. We very often have to adapt to the environment we get in, uh, in our projects. And so uh, we have to, to be uh, very adaptive in our work. That's also one of the reasons we chose uh, to use uh, uh, open source software, because it's much simpler for us to adapt it to the specific need. Mm, we have, uh, uh, being 700, uh, different competencies. We are partnered for Oracle, for SAP, uh, etc. I don't want to advertise Opera 21. The experience we had is that uh, there are products, there are even too many products. So very often when you go to a customer, he has uh, married uh, SAP or he has uh, chosen a TIPCO or uh, IBM platform, so it's very difficult for us to adapt to the specific environment we get. The experience is uh, working on these uh, issues is that it's very difficult that the customer gives you a very clear advice of what, uh, what it needs and it's very tied to the as-is of the process as it is in this moment. So the risk that you go and you automatize simply the process that they already are doing. And it's very difficult in the beginning to understand which is the best solution for the customer because they start from a very specific area of their company to talk about uh, automation, uh, uh, process engineering and so. So it's very difficult to uh, have a, um, a clear view of what is the best solution for that customer. Very often you start from, as I was saying, from document intensive processes. So they just want to uh, automatize the request of acquisition and then you find out that they would like also to automate uh, all their internal back office uh, operations. Okay. Another thing that we have uh, in our experience uh, found to customers is that they are very afraid of uh, immobilizing the company, their company. Maybe this is the Italian side of, uh, of process. <laughs> Because everybody is convinced that uh, his own way of managing his own process is the best one. So this is probably one of the problems we have the, with the SAP unit, uh, that we have a strong SAP unit, uh, we are called gold partner of SAP, is that uh, you always have something different that uh, if you don't do it, uh, then the customer will go bankrupt. So it's, it's really illogical sometimes. Then there is clearly some areas where people prefer not to describe their own process because they want to cultivate their own garden. So they know it, if they tell you how they work, they are losing power. And this is uh, it's very, it's, it's very human, but it's for companies, especially if you want to optimize costs, you, you have to have a clear idea of the processes. Many customers had a very bad experience with workflow management system, say five years ago or ten years ago, with a very expensive project that uh, miserably failed or were very to, to, to specific area of the company. So they are very afraid that you start with a small automation and then you will keep paying Opera 21 for every small change to their process, etc. And then there is a trick. Uh, a funny phrase, sentence said from one of my colleagues that in his domain they don't have processes and that was the warehouse management system and it's that, that's very difficult to explain and so the only way is to start describing it together then, so that you prove it that they have a process, they simply don't have model or documented it. Okay, uh, I will more or less uh, skip it. This one is essentially Opera 21 is a partner of uh, all the main uh, IT system producers. And we do both a generalized uh, solution and a custom solution. We have, as I was saying, specific solution for destination management system and a warehouse management system that we 
we will use uh, for the for the demo for that Florian will uh, will as an, as an example of the identifier. Okay, we started um, 2006 uh, working on processes and uh, let's say build our uh, fundamental um, knowledge. We started with the first with a project called Rose and then we moved to a project that is called uh, Janus. Rose, the objective of Rose was to um, create a unique environment where business analysts and IT can work together. So the, um, the idea was to create a, a framework where the people can work together to define the process and then using a model-driven architecture, etc., to build the, the solution that implements the processes. Uh, the experience, it was, actually we use internally parts of the ROSE project. We never uh, sold it as a, as a tool or as a product. The experience that is very difficult to create uh, an off-the-shelf um, uh, product with these capabilities, especially if you want for a small company like, uh, like ours. Um, another experience we got is that it's uh, a complex environment. Uh, the process of the BPM, uh, BPA, ARIS, uh, and all these tools. So you need to have trained uh, people, and you have to rely uh, strongly on external competencies, like uh, relying on university experts. Technology, as I was saying, is very is very complex and very hard, and in a role, we used um, heavily the generation of code that is heavily in the sense that we don't generate very much code, but uh, as much as possible when we can, we generate code that then the rule is that you cannot change the generated code and uh, uh, it should look at, at least as much as possible to what you would write. Otherwise, it becomes uh, quickly unmanageable. Okay, another consideration on, uh, on the process and on the raw experience is that um, if you want, having to, co to cope with legacy system and legacy organ into the organization is very difficult to impose an organizational uh, structure. In particular on the authorization um, management, you, on legacy is very uh, often you find people uh, authorized to the specific function or to the specific CICS uh, uh, transaction. So this is very complex to uh, change the way they organize their, um, their work to model to a role-based access control. Also, you, you can have also problems with uh, um, responsibilities into the company. For example, in banks, if you're authorized to a specific uh, transaction, uh, you could have uh, a benefit into your pay because you are treating real money, for example. We found out in the Rose experience that uh, it's plenty of uh, processes uh, uh, modeled. Uh, mainly they stay on paper, they never... Uh, they are probably the outcome of uh, big studies uh, done for, by Anderson Consulting or Accenture or Bank Union and uh, this organization and mainly they, they remain on paper. So uh, this sometimes is uh, an interesting um, way to, uh, have, to create an opportunity for Opera 21. So we start from that and then from there we, talk, uh, we start talking about uh, processes. One problem we often realize that this type of analysis is a very high level analysis. Coming to Janus, Janus, uh, in the same uh, idea of uh, uh, having the uh, people work uh, on the business side and on the technical side to work together, um, but it's moving from a, if you want, from an execution uh, level to an, uh, a business level. This also because the experience of Rose is that uh, mm, there are not big projects starting in this uh, crisis period. So if a framework that is used to build a, a big system in this moment is really difficult to, to sell. So uh, with Janus, uh, with the University of Trento, we are trying to propose a platform to facilitate the, 
the organization of uh, the business processes. Okay, Janus says you know, two, two main uh, uh, areas. One is the control and the monitoring of processes. So what we uh, built is a repository of processes um, at the business level. And next slide maybe will be a bit clearer. We decide this as a system integrator and as I always say, because we are lazy, to take as much as possible from what's existing on open source platforms. So as a model, we are using Signavio that we extended and integrated as a, a, a document management system because most of the processes are composed by, if you want, the diagram into BPMN and then you have plenty of uh, su supporting documentation that keep, can be legislation, can be uh, internal rules. This we do it on Alfresco, the system is uh, uh, multi-tenancy. Mm. For controlling and monitoring the uh, processes, we start from the events that happen into the system. This, we are trying also to minimize the impact on existing systems so that we can propose to um, our customer the Janus platform without having to ask them to do uh, big changes to their current, uh, current systems. One part, uh, fundamental part of a monitoring system clearly is a KPI engine that here we use uh, Pentao as a business intelligence suite to, to work on aggregate data and uh, um, we can define the, uh, KPIs using uh, different languages so that we can have uh, an IT guy writing a KPI in Java or uh, if you want a business uh, guy that can use uh, a, a language that is a sort of uh, Alexa language. Also we didn't really invent a new language that was one, something that we thought at the beginning, but it didn't make uh, much sense. On the BI, we divided the, the data warehouse, that is, if you want, the core of the system for the monitoring part, uh, in two parts. There is a process data warehouse and an application data warehouse. The process data warehouse keeps all the information about uh, the process instances, when they, were, they started, when they finished, who did it, uh, on, uh, based on what uh, authorization, etc. The application part, is depending on the specific uh, um, installation on the specific domain. So that if we go move from one customer to the other one, the, pro the process that our house will be always the same. If we move from tourist uh, tourism uh, environment to the warehouse management system, then the process which will be the same, the process that our house, the application that our house will change. This because it's important to know that uh, you know, uh, a delivery order was late, but it's important also to know that the delivery um, um, order was delayed and it was one item to send or 500 items to send. Okay. The idea I was saying is we want to monitor not the specific uh, workflow engine system or the MQ. This is uh, an end-to-end -end process where you have different actors interacting with different systems. So they interact with different systems that most of them have already their own uh, indicator of performance, how many messages I'm receiving, how many um, database records, how many tra transactions I'm doing for, for my bank, how many invoices I'm sending. The problem is that none of these users has the whole view of the business process. Not even the managers have the, the view of the business process. Maybe they know that there is inefficiency into the process. And maybe the inefficiency is between one actor and the other actor. So it's very difficult for them to understand where to improve the process. The idea of Janus is to extract from the uh, single system with what we call a Janus adapter the specific events that are meaningful for the business, not the specific uh, I don't know, state change into a delivery order, but which, which of the one of them that are meaningful at the business level. Then these uh, events are collected into a, a business process, business intelligence. On the other side, we have uh, the model of the processes and uh, the documentation of the process. These two together with uh, a dynamic KPI engine 
form the BAM, the business activity monitoring tool for the managers. So it's not something that the IT guys uses, it's something that the management uses. In fact, one change for Opera 21 is that the uh, person you have to contact uh, to sell this kind of software is not the IT manager, as we usually we do as a system integrator. But you have to move to the business management or to, uh, I don't know, uh, hospital uh, management or the, the acquisition office very often. As I was saying, the first part is uh, uh, the um, control and monitoring of processes, Janus. The second uh, important part is discovery of processes. This is due to the fact that we want to reduce time when we go to analyze uh, a potential customer. Uh, because the people that really would be able to help you in modeling the process is the people that is the most busy into the company. So they will not uh, leave them with you for three months while you model all your process with uh, the due calm, etc. So the discovery is, uh, is sort of a shortcut to uh, automatically have a draft of the process and then to work with the draft with the expert of the, the business. The other experience uh, on discovery is that uh, very often you don't want the textbook process that uh, managers can give you, you want the real process. In fact, it happened to a customer, it was a few months ago, that we got this textbook of their operational manual that was given to us. Then we modeled it with the um, uh, Bizagi. We went to speak to the people working actually on the process, they were saying, okay, this is correct, but that was three years ago. Now we are working different ways, so we have to restart from scratch the, the work. Um, one of the requests on uh, uh, Discover that we get is uh, the possibility to verify the compliance of the way the people work with their internal, internal rules or with legislation, especially if you work with, uh, with public administration. Okay, so with uh, uh, Florian and uh, Professor Casati, we uh, we had the problem of it's very difficult for us to speak to the right people in certain cases, and this is a real cases uh, when we go to replace a system already in place. Uh, then you talk to the customer and you ask, "Can I talk to the, the to the previous supplier?" Obviously, they say no. Because if you talk to him, you will understand that you want to replace him and will not give me any more support. I depend on him. So you, you really don't have the view of the full process. So we uh, understood, or we think we understood, that is the only sure information is the operational database. Or actually, the people is doing the work, the company is working. So what happens into the company is known, at least into the database. So. The idea is to try to extract it from there. Another case that uh, it happened uh, a couple of months ago, we are proposing Janus to the Areu, that is the 911, the emergency call of uh, Lombardy. Uh, they have the same system installed into each department, uh, and it is uh, one, more or less one for each uh, province of uh, Lombardy. But they, they have different measures, so they know they are all using the same software, but they know exactly how they use it. So the idea of uh, identify, identifying that will explain Florian much better than me, is to start from the different database, databases and try to understand the work they, uh, the way they work, and if there is a better way to work comparing the result of one emergency room compared to the to the next one. So. With this one, I will leave the word to Florian, and then we'll see in the end a couple of slides on uh, the future we imagine for, uh, for Janus. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. So, then uh, after the business part, Let's see at what the university gets out of these kind of projects. And in this case, we found something that we called Eventifier, which is, of course, completely different from what we wrote into the project proposal. So you always write a project proposal and you say, we do this and we do that, and then you start 
the work and at some point you say, mm, actually, mm, we already did this, it's not really fun, we already did that, when there are existing algorithms, but what else can we do? And this is somehow the, the output of this change management process inside the, the project, which was actually very well supported by Marco, and uh, which is, I think, very interesting uh, from a practical perspective. So, um, what are we talking about? So we, we are speaking about uh, a logistics company, Fricoscandia, and there are basically two information needs. One is um, understanding the processes that are there. So they have lots of processes running, uh, as Marco said, also in whatever legacy information systems, they don't know how they work internally. And the problem is that they don't have an explicit representation of their processes. So one thing is, of course, process discovery. So this is one of the key ingredients, creating the awareness of how the process look like um, that are run in Frigoscandia. Why do we want to understand processes? Well, first of all, to know um, how business is done, which are the actors maybe involved, which are the tasks that they are there in the process, and uh, which are the problems maybe. Not always companies run uh, a nice business process engine and feed the engine with a business process model already in input. Actually, this is, to my experience, this is the exception. So it's really hard to find companies that run these beautiful BPL or workflow management systems. The reality is quite different. There are lots of legacy systems and they work together and exchange mes messages and there are even very horrible things where one system reacts on exceptions thrown from one other system. And there's a very intertwined ecosystem of uh, software that works together and in the end produces what we call a business process. So understanding these dynamics is very, very important. Second, we want to measure those processes. It's not just about looking at the model, but we want to, as Marco said also, we want to assess the compliance of a process. We want to understand maybe the duration of processes. We want to understand where bottlenecks are. In, in essence, we want to, com <clears throat> to compute some kind of KPIs, or we call them also key compliance indicators, not only performance, and so on. So measuring is the first step to improving. Here, of course, this is not really a business process, but it conveys the essence. So, but how? What is now the, the traditional approach to do this? As I said, business process discovery. Let's have a look at what, how business process discovery is done. So I invested a lot of time in the next few slides, so be uh, attentive. It's very worth and a very nice animation. Okay. Business process discovery starts from an event log, which means we have a information system or a set of information systems producing events. So the strange symbol, symbols there are process progression events. And we have them on a timeline. Events are characterized by two key ingredients. One is a timestamp and one is a process instance identifier. So the timestamp allows us to order all these events on a timeline so that we have a, a strict order among them. And the process instance identifier allows us to do us um, this here. We are able to understand which events belong to which specific process instance that has been executed in our information system. So we can basically assign events of this just messy event log to what we call traces of process instances. And in this case, for example, we can order uh, the event log into three traces. We can throw away the timeline and we see three individual logs that allow us now to understand how these instances have been executed. Here, there are different uh, algorithms for process discovery. And what we get out are process models that describe the behavior of the individual um, traces, the events in the traces. So basically, you take the trace, you crunch it a little bit, and you get out the model that is able to generate uh, a trace like the one we have, for example, there. As a next step, we throw away the traces, 
and we crunch the models. And what we get out is hopefully one model that describes the whole process that has been executed. Of course, the assumption is that all the process instances, they stem from the same process model. So the goal of process discovery is to identify the process model from the event log that is able to describe the event log, to explain why the events are there in the event log as they are. Okay, as I said, this is the ideal situation and this is more or less what we were expected to do also in the project. But <clears throat> we said that's not fun. So let's think about something where we miss the key ingredient and this is actually what we really have in many situations. It's not that we don't have just the process engine, we also lack the event log. So what do we do now? Um, the situation we have in reality is not this, but something like this. So we have just events randomly ordered and uh, from many different systems maybe. So we can have uh, Java exceptions, emails or so on. So you can try to discover processes from emails, of course. So we didn't do this, but there's a lot of process knowledge in emails. It's uh, very interesting. Um, we might not have Java exceptions because we simply don't have a Java implementation of our process. We might not have uh, emails because we don't want to go into privacy issues or whatever other problems. But as Marco said, we always have a, a database. So in the end, each company that runs an information system has uh, whatever software components and they write at some point into a database. So our question now is how do, how do we reconstruct an event log just by looking at the database underlying the information system? <clears throat> so this is the abstraction we want to work with. We say there's a company that has basically what we call a process aware information system that reads and writes into an operational database. Okay, let's have a look inside. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can shrink a little bit. So this is an excerpt of the database that uh, comes from our partner in the project. I don't show you real data. I only show you a piece of the schema. But uh, the problem is really this. This is, for example, the warehouse management system delivery order uh, detail table. We have uh, lots of attributes there and we have lots of relationships and we have another table here, the warehouse management system, ship dispatch detail table. And the question is, okay, um, can we look at the data structured like this and extract a process model, which means first extract an event log? Hopefully the answer to this is yes. So let, let's see. Um, let's conceptualize the two tables. Uh, on top, we have the, the business process we are interested in. In this case, with Frigo Scandia, it's actually very simple. We have a, an order application, we have a planning application, a picking and a dispatching application. So this is the delivery of goods from the warehouse to the, to the customers, which are big grocery stores in Italy. <clears throat> and uh, what we have is that there's a big um, relational database uh, underlying these systems. This is just a schematic example. And there are parts of this database that are actually affected by the execution of the uh, applications on top, meaning these applications, they either write into those tables or they read from those tables. This is what we call the process database. All the rest we basically don't care very much about. Maybe there are lots of tables in the database about um, the, the time, uh, months, and, and, and locations, and people, and so on. So all these rather static data we are not very much interested in. So we look at those tables that are affected by process execution. <clears throat> then let's pick one table. So here on top, these are basically the attributes of the, uh, of the table we saw before. And then you can imagine that there's an expansion of these tables which means there's real data in the information system. Now, 
um, how do we identify an event? What is an event? When it's, it's really tricky. There's a database. Uh, conceptually, you can say everything you do in a database can be an event. So if you add a new table at some point during the lifetime of your database, maybe this corresponds to a, a business event. Maybe yes, maybe no. It's probably a, a change. Uh, adding a table is probably a change that we are not interested in, but it could be. Then um, adding new attributes, meaning change in the structure, could be a v an event. But again, this is more design time. It's, um, really, this is software development change. Could be an event, but very likely it's not an event we are interested in to discover uh, the business process. It's more a, a software maintenance process issue. Um, what we are probably interested in is just looking at the the specific expansion of the tables, meaning the data we have there. But there, we can have different options. So just to say, is this row an event? I mean, is this an indication of an event? Or maybe do we need to aggregate three different rows, uh, rows to say, hmm, this could be an event. Same here, is this an event? Is this, this the third row and the first, are they different? Well, we don't know exactly. So one thing here is clear. The whole approach of extracting events from a database, this cannot be fully automated. So we, we need a lot of uh, help from the domain expert. So knowing the database means knowing which tables to look at, knowing at least a little bit uh, of what the dynamics is of how the different uh, software pieces of the information systems write and read uh, into the database or from the database. So completely automating we cannot do, but we can assist it a little bit. So what we need to assist is the identification of events. This is the first step. Then we can ask us about the order. Okay, when I can decide that all rows in a given table correspond to a specific step like uh, placing an order, relatively trivial. But then, what is the order among these events? When, for example, we could start here and then go here and here. Or it could be exactly the opposite. When from here, we could go here, here. Or we start in the middle and then this happens and this happens and so on. So again, uh, we cannot really decide this automatically. We need to find a nice heuristic to order events. Then what about the payload of events? So an event is not just an identifier or saying uh, it, it happened. No, we need to say that it happened, when it happened, hopefully. And we need to assign some data to it because, uh, as we said, we want to um, compute also indicators on these events. So we want to compute metrics. And we cannot just compute metrics on timestamps, very likely. We want to compute metrics about uh, business data, payload of events, like um, if we place an order, the number of items ordered or the amount of money exchanged in a transaction or, or similar. <clears throat> this is again very domain specific and uh, we uh, try to assist this with uh, heuristics. Then payload is also very important for correlation. So we need, uh, in the end, what we want to get is traces of process instances. That is, we need to be able to understand which events pertain to which process instance. So it's not enough to just say, this is a bunch of events. No, we want to know that these are events, and these are the events of instance one, these are the events of instance two. So we need to carefully select the payload that we want to put into the events so that we can write um, correlation rules that then tell us how the process instances look like. We will see the demo afterwards. <clears throat> For example, we could say that the two red events are one instance and the yellow event is maybe another instance. <clears throat> okay, what we want to get in the end is an event structure like this. Just an event is has an ID. This we can just generate automatically. It has a task name, a process name. As you have seen, the task name, we can derive, for example, from the structure of the information system. As I said, we have a, a pick, we have a plan, we have a, a, a delivery task there. And this is 
expert knowledge that we already feed into our tool. The process name, we just give it, because we know we are now trying to discover the, um, the delivery process. The process instance identifier, this is something that we want to generate out of the data. The timestamp is also something that we want to identify. And the payload, this is what we need to define and decide upon what to put there. <clears throat> okay, let's look again inside the database. So these are the, the specific problems that we have to, to solve if we want to deal with a table like this. But of course, um, Manfred showed that problems are not only in single uh, process models, and here the problems are not just single tables, but um, size matters. So let me zoom out a little bit. It's not working. Uh -huh. So this is the, the real schema of the database by Frigo Scandia. And there are, I don't know, I didn't count the tables, but there are lot, lots of tables. I don't know why this is not centered now. Okay. So we were just looking at a very small corner there on top. So one of the big issues here is also to guide the expert toward those tables that are really interested, uh, interesting for process discovery. This is what we said, um, the identification of the process database. All the rest, we don't care. And then, of course, each process has different tables that it, it works on. <clears throat> so we go back. This is what happens now. So this is today. Doing this means writing manually lots of database scripts. We partly did this. We tested the whole database and we wrote, there are only four, but we did lots of them together with the team by Marco. And this is, of course, not really something we can do in practice. So what we want to do now, and this is the proposal <clears throat> we, came up, uh, we came up with in university for this project, is to semi-automatically construct the event log out of a database like this. So we want to assist the domain expert in uh, doing the whole process discovery and metrics computation by first reconstructing an event log from the database. So what we, <clears throat> what we do is we split the task into two steps. We do first uh, eventification, where we propose a set of uh, eventification patterns which the domain expert can configure with some identification rules, like saying uh, for this table I apply this rule, for that table I apply another rule. And what we get is uh, a database or an event log of not correlated events. Then we have uh, another step, which is the event correlation step, where the domain expert um, can configure correlation rules among the uh, attributes in the payload of the event that we identified and then hopefully in, in the end we get a nicely correlated event log that we can use to discover the real process model. Um, the whole process here is meant to be highly interactive and iterative. So the expert for example defines a rule then visualizes the result, goes back, goes forth, goes back, goes forth, till he is happy with the result. Because this is very hard to, to see as a waterfall model. It's not just define a rule, write a rule, a Boolean rule over attributes, and that's it. So it's always a try and uh, test uh, step. OK, we have a set of identification patterns, which are basically uh, SQL queries. I'm not going to explain these. These are here more to scare people. So then there are other, there's an ordering logic, a payload logic. So basically I show here how we construct from zero the, the, um, the attributes of the events just here in the lower part. In the end we come up with a, an event structure that is filled with payload and with all the other attributes. So this is still very much under construction and we are working on this and there, there will always, for each different database, there will be different, uh, mm, different patterns, different heuristics, and this is 
this part here is something that is more methodological, and in the end, you always have to look at the specific problem you have in front of you. <clears throat> okay, so here we, um, we have a, a demo of the tool we came up with. It's still a very preliminary demo. It's not as interactive and iterative as we would like it to be. So let's try. Okay, this is the eventifier. We start by opening uh, a file where there is some minimum information already there. I need to constantly move the mouse, otherwise I lose the, the control bar. So here we just open uh, a file where we have the basic configuration with the access information for the database. <clears throat> Nothing more. In the next step, the actual work begins. Okay, let me stop here. So here, this is already to be fast with the video. So here we pre-computed or we preloaded uh, a set of tasks. So here we can add tasks. And then we have the tasks here. There are now the four tasks. We set the insert order, the pick, the, the ship, and I, the plan. Uh, so insert, plan, pick, and ship are the four tasks. So we, we know that these tasks are there, but we don't know exactly in which order they are executed. What we do here is we this is the database. We only use an excerpt of the big database. Here, the process ex uh, the domain expert can basically say, um, oh, sorry, let's go back. So it's tricky. If the, if the bar is there, the click means pause, break. If the bar is not there, then it means next slide. So that's why I have to constantly move a little bit here. <clears throat> okay, let's go again to the but there, yeah, uh, we can do it. Okay, so what we then do here is we say um, the insert task, out of all the tables we saw in the database, the insert task is related with these two tables here, the insert order detail and the insert order header table. So what we basically want to do is, yeah, we want to compute a, a join and say, okay, the insert table is then related to the join of these two tables somehow. Then we have pick, dispatch, and again, the insert tasks. Let's go to the next step. So here we write the, the join condition. So uh, the event, we associate it either to one table or to a join of multiple tables. Why the join? Simply because if we join them immediately, then afterwards we can maybe pick the right attributes for the payload. And here, this is just a preview of the data. It's rather meaningless, but this is it's just a visualization of the join of the two tables so that the domain expert can have a look at uh, how the data looks like in practice. So this is more interesting now. Let me stop it. <clears throat> in this step here, we apply the different uh, eventification patterns. So we we had, so far we use three different identification patterns. There's the single row, single event pattern, which means each row considered an event. Then we have the single row, multiple event pattern. So what we can do is we can look into the details of a single row and sometimes you see that there is a, a column which is updated or update time of update or there's a, a logical delete. There's a deleted column that is either true or false. And what can we derive from this? That <clears throat> the existence of the row, the existence of the line in the database means a creation. So an order has been placed. If there's an update column, then probably this is a, an update of the order. And if we have a a delete, the logical delete, and we can also say that this is an order delete event. So there might be multiple events associated to one single row. And then we have the multiple row single event pattern. Of course, there could be the multiple row and multiple event pattern and so on, but we just implemented, uh, oh, no. It's just not possible to keep it constantly on, but we can jump. Okay, no. Where was it? 
Okay, so in this case, we assign the insert, we use the single row, single event pattern, and for the plan, we use a single row, multiple event pattern with a condition. Believe me, this, this works in the end. This is a preview of what we get, for example, for the pick task. Let's be a bit faster. The preview is not so interesting. So here we have the event ordering now. So for the dispatch task, we see all the possible attributes of the join of the tables, and now the, the main expert can choose which of the attributes is a good uh, ordering attribute. So if there's a timestamp, that's a very good uh, candidate, but also identifiers or logical timestamps or so on could do the job. So oop. let's go on. Data association, this means um, we choose the payload. For example, here I think we, this will be opened. So here we chose two attributes to be added to the payload of the events, the order ref and the, uh, what is this, the client ref. And here we saw just again the list of all attributes. Then based on their relevance, we can order them. Uh, these are the final attributes of our event, the ID, task name, process, uh, name, process, uh, I don't know, identifier, I think, timestamp, and the two payload events. We generate the event log. <clears throat> Let's be, I can accelerate this high performance computing. Yes. And what we get is statistics, we don't care. Okay, here we can now, now we have, a, we, we have the non-correlated event log. Now we need to correlate these events and here we can write very simple uh, conditions over the payload probably of the events we identified in order to uh, reconstruct process instances. This is very abstract now and this is where I uh, said we need to have a lot of uh, interactive uh, interactivity in the tool. Let's just go here. It's computing. <coughs> okay, I, we said high-speed computing. Yeah. <clears throat> and we visualize then the process instances that we could reconstruct like this. So you see each color in the lower left part of the image they correspond to a different task. We had the four tasks. And the columns then basically correspond to process instances. So we have a, an insert event and a plan event, and then we have a pick, 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 and the dispatch in the end. Yeah. So we, I'm sorry, but this is trickier than expected. Okay. And let's just accelerate and go to the... So here what we did is we stole the heuristic minor from the prompt tool and included it into the demo. And uh, we did process mining on our log that we reconstructed from the database. And this is the process, it's trivial. But still, this is, this is exactly the process that uh, we expected to find. And I will show you that we actually found also a bit more than expected. But um, it works. The process, uh, the, the eventifier really t starts from the database. Then you, you need to imagine this very much interactive tool with lots of visualizations that live, that change live and interactively so that you immediately have feedback about how correlation rules affect the, the shape of the traces and so on. <clears throat> so we. We computed some metrics here, which are not so important now. Uh, the important thing maybe is that we have a overall precision here that is actually quite good, 92% more or less of uh, precision of the whole uh, eventification process, of course, only in this example. But then if you think that doing process discovery on top of this uh, event log is again a statistical process, we basically kick out the noise or the, the, the few events that we miss are not so important compared to the, uh, let, let's say if, if we crunch the process discovery algorithm on top. What happened is that we discovered actually this, uh, which is a, a very interesting back loop 
that nobody expected, and uh, especially Marco and his his team, they were very astonished by this, and uh, they said, oh. so in the beginning they were not very convinced about this whole disco process discovery and their identification process, but we did it and we came up with this, and then, yeah, we took a whole day to agree that this is really there, and they took, I don't know, se several days to understand, okay, uh, it is there and it corresponds to a, a bug in our system that has been there for, I don't know, several months, and they were not aware of, so, also, the whole process discovery exercise was actually a success in the end. So, fireworks, and that's it from my side. There's still two slides by Marco, I think. Is it, there's time, right? Okay, just very fast uh, what we are working on, and uh, I mainly present it also, uh, we are looking for collaboration and uh, we think this could be an interesting project to collaborate with uh, BPM people and BPM experts like you. Uh, the next step of Janus uh, is uh, uh, going to toward the cloud. As I said, the Janus is already uh, multi-tenancy. Uh, we believe in a process as a service. As a company, we have a call center that we want to move to some more, if you want, uh, clever and more uh, uh, revenue uh, important. So what we are trying to do, the next step of the Janus is uh, we'd like to go to the past and support the process as a service. Uh, there we have to uh, manage the quality of service and to be able to manage quality of services between different tenants so that you manage to uh, arrive to the minimal service to all your customers. And the one thing we notice into the experience we have in uh, with the warehouse management system and the tourism offering is that it's really the small services that make the difference between earning and losing money. So any service that you do for free, even if it's very small, will make a difference. So. The next step for Janus, I will be very quick, is to have uh, to add to the Janus to the process repository, a repository for the contracts that you have with your customers and the SLA that you guarantee to your customers. Then to develop uh, a monitor, that real-time real -time monitor to manage the SLA quality you are giving to each one of your tenants. And giving the, this information, we want to move to the accounting of the service. One thing that uh, we realized is that uh, uh, we have the billing and accounting uh, subsystem into the warehouse management system. And the, man the data that they manage uh, to do the, this accounting part is exactly the same that we manage to do process monitoring and process control. So f for us, it's an extension that we think is, uh, is feasible and it's probably interesting to open new market uh, possibility for Opera 21. So if anybody's interested in collaborating with us, uh, uh, myself or Flo, we, we, we work very close together. So just contact us for any possible collaboration. Thank you. Let's uh, thank uh, Florian and uh, Michael one more time. <clears throat> Then we come to an end of the morning program, and it's my pleasure to invite you to lunch. Lunch is served in the foyer, just outside uh, this hall, and we will reconvene at, when was it again, Bill? 1.30. 1.30. Okay, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>